Welcome back to Dairy Public Radio. Reporting from the basement of the Dairy Civic Center, this is CM Alexander with the news. A Sanford woman hiking a Castle County section of the Appalachian Trail with her two children has reported her daughter, nine-year-old Patricia McFarland, missing and presumably lost in the woods west of TR-90 in the town of Mountain. Police ask that you call the hotline with any tips. You're listening to Dairy Public Radio. This is Dairy Public Radio. Welcome back to Dairy Public Radio, a bi-weekly Stephen King Book Club podcast. I'm one of your hosts, CM Alexander, alongside Joshua Khan. Hey, everybody. And Benjamin Graham. Hey, constant readers. <laughs> and today we are covering The Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon, another Patreon selection by Kaya Benedict. And we are reading through the fifth inning if you are following along. And if not, major spoilers ahead. And Josh is leading our discussion. First off, uh, I've never read this before. Am I alone? I have never read this one. Awesome. Same. Th- awesome. This is like, this came out around the time that I was like between my king phases. This I put in the same category as from a Buick 8. They are the, like, weird, little lesser-known Stephen King books that came out in the, like, mid-2000s that I had no interest in reading, really. I, in this case, am, was mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what's great, is that we are, we're on a hell of a run. We had Lisey's story that was a first for all of us. Mm-hmm. We had from a Buick 8, the first of us. This is another first. And... I mean, at least for my part of it, they've all been pleasant surprises because they weren't what I expected out of them. And this certainly, just by the title, I had no idea what I was getting in for, and I could not be happier. Can I just say real quick, I thought about you guys a lot while I was reading this first part because I was thinking of the last, like, in the woods freaked me out thing that we had, which for me was the body in different seasons. Mm. And I remember really loving that one spooky part in the woods, but I couldn't get into the characters, like all these little boys. I just couldn't relate to them. And we had a conversation about that. Now I'm like, Mm -hmm. yeah, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I get this. And then I was like, oh fuck, so much baseball. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. That's another reason I had, I like, I kind of passed this book over is you put in the name of a baseball player in the title of your book. And I'm like, Oh, it's about baseball. Why would I read this? Uh, as it turns out, not as huge a part of the plot as I thought. I did go see if those games did happen. Here's, I went back and I checked to see, and an, they did not. Here's an embarrassing oh, question. That, Tom Gordon, not, a real person? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I thought so. I thought so. Also, not quite accurate, Josh. Uh, go on. Do we? Do you just want me to whip out the baseball knowledge that I somehow have right whip, now? <laughs> whip out your baseball. Right, are you a big baseball head, no. CM? No. No. You, we know CM's not a ball gal. Not a ball boy, not a car boy. A friend of the show, Jeff Loader, has given me some helpful information about baseball so that I can understand better what I'm reading and not sound like a moron like I feel like I often do. <laughs> <laughs> and so if I get any of it wrong or I say something weird, it's my fault, not his. But the first game that we get in the story is actually based off of a real game that happened in 1998. It was Friday, May 22nd. There were only three games that it could have been in this short time span from when the book was published and everything. The second game is fake. And not everything in the first game that happens is like blow by blow accurate. Sure. But it's essentially that game it's alluding is, to a real game. that that ending is the same because i did watch the end of that game i just thought it wasn't a real thing because i noticed that the date was in may mm-hmm. huh. and once we've kind of talked more about what the story is about i have some fun baseball <laughs> connections to what's <laughs> happening i think <laughs> i cannot <laughs> wait to find out if your thoughts are right uh all right let's dive into the girl who loved Tom Gordon. We follow our protagonist, Trisha McFarland, who on this beautiful June day in 1998, at nine years old, will be lost in the woods. Nice to give us that right up front, right? Yeah, this is another one that wastes no time yeah. getting to it. Yeah, and I love that. It's very upsetting instantly. And if you haven't been lost in the woods before, 
great. <laughs> Have you been lost in the woods before, CM? I thought about trying just just to <laughs> what? What? <laughs> just to get in the like. The, listen, I did baseball research. I'm not going to go out in the woods and see for what episode, that's all save about. Save it for episode two. Save it for <laughs> that's episode two. Madness. No, but I I did trek through. A, a part of the bike path by our house in <laughs> the woods that I am the very toy familiar woods. with that I've been going to since I was a teenager. Yeah, the toy woods. <laughs> I love that one. That, that was a great place, yeah. And then I went to this part that is like all overgrown and stuff. I feel like a moron because I didn't realize that trails and don't aren't part of woods that is <laughs> something <laughs> you just don't you know you just don't think about it like because and josh <laughs> I, I, I grew up in the country so like woods like hunting wood like yeah. uh, wilderness like that's no but i'm talking about like overgrown things that you literally can't walk through like mm. you would need yeah, a it's, house. woods it's oh the big <laughs> <laughs> no it's the biggest thing because i personally i'm not an outdoor kid like i've never been but i was in the the boy scouts uh for a while so I've been in the woods. I, I get how much the woods suck. <laughs> and so like throughout this entire thing, when when they reveal that she's made it nine miles mm-hmm. in like a. 10 hours, I'm like through the thick ass woods that it has been describing. Mm-hmm. That's impressive. Yeah. All right. Let's man. <laughs> we are so, so much. hyped. I'm, uh, okay. So before we get further than that, uh, in the story, <laughs> we get a jump back to see what Trisha's family dynamics are. Should we talk about how what her family is going through right now? Yeah, Trisha is was she nine years old yes. right now. She has a brother, Pete, who's fourteen, mm-hmm. and a mother, Quilla. Right? Yeah. Sure. It's, yeah. it's pronounced Quilla in is the it? audiobook. Yeah, in oh. the audiobook they call her Quilla, uh, <laughs> which is All right, and Trash, calm down. <laughs> Q. And, uh, <laughs> and her dad. Oh, man, I forgot his name. I was doing so well. Larry. Larry. And the interesting thing about Trisha is that her parents have recently gotten a divorce after what seems to be a very rocky split. I find it interesting that we have no idea what, I mean, not that a nine-year-old would probably understand the reasons behind Mm -hmm. the divorce. Oh, the only reason we get is alluded to with Pete yelling, why are we paying for what you did wrong? Or- also, that her dad's clearly an alcoholic. Yeah. Like, that's obviously a contributing factor. It, absolutely. It, well, it made me wonder if this is post-divorce spiral or this is something that led to the divorce mm. because they haven't. No, it has to have been an ongoing thing because at one point, uh, Trisha thinks – about how her new house doesn't smell like stale beer. Yeah, the way oh, yeah. Old house did. Nope, you're right. Yeah, yeah that's uh, there's so much of that that's a real bummer. Yeah. Anyway, her her brother is 14 and he's an asshole, <laughs> and a nerd, like a stereotypical nerd yeah. that gets picked on a lot. And Trisha is just as unkind about it as her mom. <laughs> like she's like, I hate this fucking nerd. <laughs> <laughs> she's. Uh, see, I didn't feel that way about her. No? Being being a little sister. Mm, sure. My brother was a teenager when I definitely was oh, not. Oh, I guarantee my little sister thinks <laughs> this way about her. <laughs> it sounds right. It's, and I, I am sympathetic to Pete because his issue is that um, Q and her children moved away. Mm. I'm just, I'm going to call her Quilla because yeah, that's what I've been hearing, yeah. but I feel dumb now. <laughs> no, it's, it's they, not a name. We'll go, we'll go or with maybe Quilla. maybe it is a name. Anyway, so they, they moved away and he had friends in his old school. He was like leader of the computer club or something. Like he had his click. King of the nerds. Yep. And now he is a loner and also a nerd. And so he gets bullied and stuff. And mom is not as sympathetic to that as I want her to be. But for me, Trish was just, I feel like she's caught in the middle of, Mm -hmm. you know, she's going through a lot of shit and having to put up with this. And can't understand what he's going through and is just trying to, going back and forth, she talks about this a few times, which I really liked, between I'm just going to pretend like everything's the best thing in the world and maybe my excitement will run off, rub off on somebody else, and then just trying not to cause any trouble. One of the big things that jumped out to me, and I don't want this to sound like I'm judging anybody who does this, but it was not my experience. My parents are divorced. And my mom kept her the new last name because that was my last name. Mm. And she wanted me to 
grow up with someone with my last name with me. And so when they make a point that one of the things that Pete hates is that his mom changed her name back, which also that's that's a decision you probably don't make lightly. Mm -hmm. So I imagine there's contention. Yeah. And it's I think that also builds on the why the mother and son go at each other so fiercely, because it's clearly things that are not his place to understand Mm -hmm. because obviously she had some very strong emotional choices if she was doing that and taking the kids and they move uh, from Boston to Maine. So Mm -hmm. I don't know what that kind of distance is like. It's obviously enough to go back and forth every other weekend, but still it's jarring for them. And so there's a lot of things that clearly the kids don't understand and Mm -hmm. we don't understand. Yeah. Yeah. They should be going to therapy instead (laughs) of going to the woods. And on the weekends that they're with their mom, she has been planning outings. And sometimes it's stuff that she wants, thinks is interesting and wants to go see. Sometimes it's specifically for them. But it's usually always the same. Her and Pete fight and Trisha finds, tries to find something to enjoy, wishing she was at home reading a book. I Mm -hmm. love the idea of outings, though. Man, I could never have a teenage boy. I'd piss him off all the time. (laughs) It's just that, like, she's clearly just trying to keep them occupied and give them new experiences and things that are learning opportunities too, and spending time with them instead of finding a new boyfriend who sucks and exposing them to assholes. (laughs) It it is a very um, convincing family dynamic. Mm -hmm. Yes. It is. You get the feeling that these are pretty, pretty real people. You can relate to all of them instantly. Before we get to the trail, Cannot believe we're this far and we have not even gotten to the trail yet. But it's in this car ride while she's hearing her brother and mom fighting that she talks about her prized possession. It's her baseball cap that's autographed by her favorite player, Tom Gordon. And it builds on this more throughout this first part of the reading. But you it really that uh, connection with her dad and baseball, Mm -hmm. it turns out to be like such a important thing. That's a thing that got me like real bad through all this uh, because, you know, I've got a little Mm -hmm. girl and the way she talks about her dad and then the way she thinks about her dad in those moments. I'm like, God, that's tough. Like to hope like, yeah, you hope your kid looks at you as their hero, but man, you don't want them to have to be thinking about how your breath smells like beer. (laughs) It's it's caused a maturity in her, I think, in the way she thinks, which startles me because I have to keep reminding myself she's nine. She, she has her doll Mona, on her lap in the back seat. I was going to say, really? Because I never for a second in this book forgot that this character was nine years old. But, uh, I think yeah. he does a really good job. Yeah. No, yeah, I just mean her her maturity mm. when she's thinking about her dad yeah. primarily was... That makes sense. It yeah. was like, oh, you're not old enough to have those thoughts. Yeah, they're <laughs> definitely I mean too adult that, yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah. They're too empathetic. To yeah. how what he's going through you, as an yeah. adult, I she guess. She shouldn't know anything. Right. She should just be a happy kid. <laughs> so escaping, the way she escapes this fighting is she uh, fantasizes about casually running into Tom Gordon on her way to her <laughs> friend Pepsi's house. It's so it's so it's such, a, it's such a nine-year-old <laughs> fantasy, like run and say hi to your hero on your way to your friend's house, whatever. If he touched her hand, she would die. <laughs> <laughs> J- just a real quick note, though. I do have to add Pepsi to <laughs> the list of I, worst king names, I, I think. I it's, love it. It's, you're right. It is bad, but... Well, re- <laughs> her name is Penelope, but her nickname is Pepsi. I wish I had a friend named Penelope because I would start calling her Pepsi. <laughs> <laughs> Nicknames can be for anybody. From now on, <laughs> I'm Pepsi Alexander. <laughs> that sounds real sexy, actually. <laughs> Does it? Kind of. <laughs> sounds a little uh, corporate for we'll me. Let the listeners tell us. Yeah. <laughs> Not uh, sponsored. Yeah. <laughs> All right, it's time for uh, also one of my favorite things about this, the chapter titles. We're, we're at the first inning. Mm-hmm. Mm. Everything has been the pregame until now. So now we are at the trailhead. Clouds are starting to gather. They've they've got their backpacks full of uh, some snacks, their lunches, ponchos, you know, the standard things you'd need on a trail that is, it's supposed to be just like an afternoons. Mm-hmm. It, it won't be all day. Mm-hmm. And it's rated a moderate trail. But they have a van at the end that'll drive them back yeah. to their car. So it's long so enough. So it's a few hours. Yeah. Yeah. And... It's not too long into this trail before her mom and brother start fighting and she 
we we get to feel how miserable she becomes almost instantly because she tries what you mentioned earlier, Sam. Like she's genuinely excited because she sees a water pump and she's mm-hmm. never seen one before and she's trying to get their attention. She's genuinely happy. And you watch that genuine excitement just be extinguished. Mm-hmm. And you get like, oh, this is this is the kind of day it's gonna be. I could <laughs> that she's like, they could have done this at home and I could be reading a book. <laughs> yeah. Which I really felt like it hit all of us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then she refers to herself as the invisible girl, which again, man, yep. it's um, it's the mist. It's it's Billy kind of all over again. Not that same severity, but making himself smaller. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's that same. You, you never want to go through reading a kid doing that to themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the invisible girl needs to pee. And so she uh, leaves the heart fields to wander <laughs> off. Jeez. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> no, because the first time, when well, this is a reference in case anyone hasn't heard these episodes, to Mr. Mercedes, mm-hmm. the relationship between uh, a mother and son. Yes. But I I was, I was, listened and I read, because I like to do both if mm-hmm. I have time. And the first time I listened, I must have been doing something because she references them bickering like lovers. Yes. Yeah. And I was like, oh, are they with a the dad? And then I had to like go back and figure it out. So that, <laughs> that really struck me, Josh. Just yeah, now. That, I, the it's same not way. like that at all. It is not it's at all. Funny thing, but, but just that she kept like she says it once, and then she says it like two more times in the explanation of the, that that they quarrel like something lovers. Something only a child who doesn't know enough about how <laughs> disgusting the world is could get away with saying. <laughs> it, it's a thing that she's nine years old, and she her only frame of reference for this arguing is. Her mom and dad yeah. arguing. Oh, yeah. fuck. She's ben. caught in the yeah. same loop Ouch. of this. Yeah. I feel dumb that I missed hey, that. Hey, we tried to make it about gross sex <laughs> stuff, Ben. <laughs> I'll try harder next time. <laughs> so she decides they've reached this fork in the path and her family goes one direction and she decides, I'm not going to follow them. I'm going to go down this other side. And I'm going to pee over here. But then she's like, I don't want to just drop trow in the middle of a trail. I'll, I'll go off the trail a little bit. That's fine. Goes far enough. She can still hear other hikers. Mm-hmm. I should probably go a little deeper so nobody like sees me. She doesn't really have to pee. <laughs> yeah. <she> also. Just, <laughs> oh, isn't that just kind of the rub? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And she does her business and is like, you know, by now, I bet they've already noticed that I'm gone and they're probably freaking out. I'll just cut straight through. It was a why. I... I- <laughs> I, sorry, I love that it it's described as, and then she made the worst mistake of her life. I okay, like Give I us said, that Boy Scout. Knowledge. Like I said earlier, <laughs> I was in the Boy Scouts. I was maybe the worst Boy Scout. Um, <laughs> I did not pay attention. I did not. I fucking hate being outside. I I remember very little of my wilderness survival training. <laughs> But here's a few things I do remember. Never fucking leave the trail. Mm -hmm. If you get lost, don't sprint as fast as you can in any direction. (laughs) There are no shortcuts. Oh, (laughs) it drives me this entire Mm -hmm. book. First of all, I did not realize until I started reading this book how much of a base primal fear being lost in the woods is to me. Mm -hmm. I did learn that about myself. Wow. Because this book, from this point on, stresses me the fuck out. Yes. (laughs) Really bad. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, no, it's when, okay, so she decides to cut through the woods to reach the trail that she knows that her uh, mom and brother are on. And after she's walked a while, she starts thinking, oh, don't, don't deviate because you might get lost. <laughs> and a voice in her head, a cold voice in her head says, "You're that's too late. You're already gone. Mm. It's so scary. The, the way it's described is she has that thought and then she feels like her guts take root to that fear. And I, I felt that moment. It's It's this awful feeling of like... Just the slow doom setting in. This entire book is just one thing after another of it's worse now. Mm -hmm. And it's so bad. I'm so glad that you phrased it that way. Because we're getting to her first major freak out. And I wanted to dive into this uh, because 
immediately after this first freak out, I thought it's going to get so much worse before it gets better. So I want to like really set this one in our mind so we can gauge it. Compare it. Yeah. Later. <laughs> like that's it, it. It feels like a, an interesting idea to me. Maybe it'll be stupid. We'll <laughs> find out. So her first freak out, she's like, like you said, Ben, she's gone about 10 minutes weaving through underbrush, realizing she's lost. And she comes to a, a deadfall and there's no way around it. There is a way under it. So she decides she's going to crawl under it and she accidentally touches a snake and like flips out. So she like bangs the back of her head on the tree and is scratches herself up frantically trying to get through it. It's very natural. It's very real. I'd also freak mm. out if I was crawling under a tree and a okay. snake moved under my hand. This might sound weird. My favorite kind of snake is a hognose snake because they're cute. They oh, have a little have a upturned little, nose. Yeah. So when that happened, it's like, oh, it didn't bite her. I wonder what kind of cute snake it was. <laughs> and then I had to remember in those situations, I've always been looking for one. Mm. So to have mm. one all of a sudden under your hand would be abysmal. Yeah. I mean, have you ever what put your hand on, like, accidentally put your hand, like, on a bug or something? Mm. And it's just, it's <laughs> like it was made of lava. <laughs> you freak yes. out so hard. I love the phrase, uh, she s- describes it as a cold, like, a, the feeling of a cold muscle. And I'm like, oh, that's such a, yeah, that's what snakes feel like. Yeah. yeah. Good writing. <laughs> <laughs> but after this, Trisha adopts. I probably the best strategy she's had so far, which is picking landmark to landmark to move her way through the woods. No, (laughs) no, that's not the best idea she's had so far. If she had reached the deadfall fall and just fucking stopped. Yes. This book would be over by chapter two. Exactly. We're all even though. Like, we know it's not going to stop Mm -hmm. because there wouldn't be a book. We're all screaming at her, don't Mm -hmm. move, right? Because I even read, like, listening and then reading it again. So I've been through it three times. I'm like, just stop. (laughs) Just stay there. Not a, this is going to be a weird jump. Did either of you in school read Hatchet? Yes. Yes. (laughs) I thought about Hatchet the whole time. I did too. The whole time I kept thinking about Hatchet. And and then I read My Side of the Mountain because I was like, Mm -hmm. I think I'm into this shit. It Mm -hmm. was such a like, he makes friends with with raccoons and he has like a hot tub in his Mm treehouse that he built. I was like, no, (laughs) this is bullshit. Did you know there are two sequels to that book? What? Uh, Hatchet? Hatchet. Uh, Brian's Summer and Brian's Winter, right? Yeah. yeah. Do you guys see Alternate the movie? Alternate history. Did There's a see? movie? Yes, it's um, what? the the older brother from uh, the Tim Allen show, Home Improvement. Okay. Yeah, Are you he plays Carrie Brad? Too? From Carrie Brad. 2? <laughs> He's... Huh. He Weird. Plays, yeah. He's Hatchet? That's crazy. Yeah, I watched it in high huh. school. <laughs> I did not hatchet. know it was a movie. Who knew? Yeah. Uh, no, I I thought about Hatchet a lot. I remember yeah. very like, much like my I, I count the Hatchet as survival training. Right, right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, is is that the reason that we had to read Hatchet in school? <laughs> in case we had, to, in case we ever got lost in the I woods. I hope so. Cause I that's thought, dark. <laughs> I mean, I like I said, I country folk. So I thought sure. maybe that was necessary reading for us. That's why I was so surprised that you guys both read it. Yeah. <laughs> So elitist with this country. <laughs> <laughs> so elite out in yes, the sticks. <laughs> Those elite rural folk. I'm moving to the humble East Coast. <laughs> Get away from all these highfalutin country folk. <laughs> it's about a mile into this strategy of landmark to landmark before she also has the thought, what if this is the wrong direction? Ew, that would have been yeah. my first thought. Oh, we should also mention she has, I feel like, just enough knowledge to be dangerous because her mm. mom and her mom and grandma sometimes would often go on outings with her in the forest. And like her mom taught her how to pee and not <laughs> pee all over <laughs> her pants and underwear and, you know, about berries to eat and stuff. And so I feel like she has this kind of false sense of, oh, I know what I got to do. This is it. I'm just going to stick to this and it'll be fine. But yeah, my first thought was, but what if the direction isn't the right direction? Yeah, it's it is. It's very frustrating because if her mom taught her anything about the woods, I would think the first thing that you teach is you get lost, you stay put. Mm -hmm. It is the most important thing about being in the woods. Survival quiz. Uh Oh, on the count of three, I want all three of us to point North. Hold on. Give me a second. 
I have to orient <laughs> myself. Okay, I got it. All I right. got it. All right. So we're going to go three, two, one, shoot. All right. Okay, this ready? is riveting this is, uh, yeah, radio. Yeah. This is really yeah, great. Yeah, the listeners yeah. will love this. Three, two, one, shoot. Hey, we all we got, got it. it. We did it. We're That's because we, we live by the river. Yeah, the river it is the us. only reason. <laughs> if you are intimately familiar with the Mississippi River, <laughs> then you'll get that bit. <laughs> but it's at this point that she has to actually accept that she's lost because she stops and listens again. Here's no familiar sounds that bring her any comfort. And this is the first time she cries out for help. Mm. And the sound of her own voice being so weak in the cry, like, breaks her Mm -hmm. inside Mm -hmm. all over again. I didn't make a a cry counter, but this book, if if you were going to create a tally for anything, Mm -hmm. this poor girl, Mm -hmm. I feel like at least a handful of times a chapter, it just says she breaks down and cries for a while. Yeah. It's so blessed. It gets so worse. (laughs) (laughs) So for about 15, 20 minutes, she stays in one place, yells, and nothing happens. She has another spiral of sadness, thinking about how scared her mom must be, the public spectacle this is going to be if she doesn't find them first. And in all this panic, she loses track of her landmark strategy, and that's when she's wandered off west. Can I make an observation real quick, though, about her thinking about her family? And I have something to say about this in a little bit after we get to the game. She's thinking about her family, but there's still that, uh, and I don't mean this bad towards her, but like the snottiness about it, like they're going to be worried and they should be because they should have noticed that I wasn't there anymore. I'm I'm just a little girl. (laughs) I'm going to make such a big deal about this when I'm, when I find them and I'm safe. So it's just funny because she's so instantly terrified, like genuinely scared, Mm. but still kind of hopeful. But there's still that just very, because she's a kid, that part of her that's like, and when they when I get back, I'm going to make them suffer for this. <laughs> and they don't know she's missing yeah, yet. Yeah, says they that's still That's like the next noticed. sentence. Mm-hmm. Oh. They're still fighting each other so badly, they have not even noticed she's gone. Mm-hmm. And so, what, it's been at least an hour now, right? That's what, yeah, and I was going to ask you guys, because she, she's the one who's offering generally, like, I must have traveled about a mile and it's been this long, probably. Mm. Do you guys feel like she's fairly accurate? We we only get like two outside, like this is where yeah. she's at. Mm. Like, I don't know if, if she knows enough to have a accurate estimate of how far she's traveled, for sure. example. I'd walk like a quarter of a mile and be like, it's a mile, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> yeah, I could see that it could be uh, a little unreliable narrator mm-hmm. for the distance she's gone or the concept of time. Mm-hmm. But I think we're just, she doesn't ever watch. Yeah. She goes through the checklist of things that she left like later on too. Mm-hmm. like, man, if I had brought that <laughs> with me, if I had wore my boots instead of my sneakers. Mm-hmm. And this is when she breaks Ben's other rule of survival. She like loses her cool entirely. The panic sets in and she just takes off sprinting, thinking about all she can think about is Pete saying that, you know, why are we paying for what you guys did wrong? And, uh, then she, and her thinking to herself, I was just in the van. I was just safe. And she she sprints to safety, right, Ben? <laughs> Have any of you <laughs> had that feeling where something catastrophic has gone wrong? Yes, I was just going to say, you I've have had this that thought. Fe- yes, of like, it, 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 like things that were fine. Stubborn, like, things were just fine. How can this be happening when life can and was normal a minute ago? Yeah, yes. It is, it is such a terrible horrible. feeling. Horrible, yeah. And yeah, it, it's... So stressful. <laughs> this book is emotional. <laughs> it it oh, fuck yeah. it is. It, this was a difficult read in a different way than a few of yeah. our, the last oh. difficult reads. I've there. cried twice. Oh shit! Aww. Yeah, the father daughter stuff. Yeah, man, I fucks me yeah. up. I, I didn't even up. think of that. Yeah. But yeah, I can imagine. I always think of you now when there are children involved. Josh. <laughs> I, this is a part two, she, cause she takes off running at this moment. She doesn't even know she's running, right? Cause right. she's, she's starting to get more panicky in her head. Doesn't recognize it. Doesn't realize that she started jogging and then she's just sprinting. She's not looking where she's going. She's running through like thorn bushes and getting kind of scraped up. No clue. Just like mindless, which is horrifying. And then it, it nearly becomes worse than that. 
Because she almost sprints off a goddamn cliff. Yeah, it's like I can see it so cinematically. Yes. Like the way it's described that she she runs and she stops herself in time, barely. But she looks down and sees in her head mm-hmm. because that's something we, about Trisha that we we kind of start to learn the is she has a yeah. vivid visual imagination, yes. uh, which is really cool. The mm-hmm. way it. <laughs> what yes. it comes to, <laughs> yeah, it, it's cool how we're we're actually shown this instead mm-hmm. of just well, later on. Oh, she starts hallucinating. <laughs> basically, it's cool that we are shown. No, this is just kind of how her brain works because she very vividly can see in her head her falling down this cliff and a branch punching through the bottom of her mm. jaw into her brain. If she's lucky. Yeah. <laughs> no. ah. We've seen Harold. <laughs> oh, yeah. The Fuck. stand. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, have you guys what ever... A terrible fucking thought. Have Ugh. you guys ever had a near miss that you visualized, like, oh, my God, what almost just happened, and it wrecked you? Uh, I- no, I'm extremely good at denial. <laughs> 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 I, I'll make this brief. I once was on a road that is turns into a school zone but semis also travel on it and it goes from like 55 to 25 in a in a reasonably short amount of time and i had to stop on this road to turn left and i look up is like every morning i did this but i look up one morning and i see filling everything i can see a semi bearing down on me he must not have been paying attention and didn't see me stopping and i gunned it like I just slammed on the gas pedal, weaved around oncoming traffic, this is a two lane, Fuck. into the nearest parking lot and like spun all the way around. And I could see as I was doing that, he was veering off of the road. That's how close he was to hitting me. He had to drive off the road onto the shoulder Fuck. to miss me. And I stopped and I, I watched him like get back on the road and go back. And I was so scared and angry. I was in my car, but I pointed and I screamed at him and said, no. <laughs> and then, <laughs> I, but I held it together and then I got, I got into the building where I work and I was late because I had to like sure, take a minute sure. to be able to drive again. Yeah. And I was like, I'm sorry I'm late. I almost got hit by a semi. And then I saw what almost happened in my head and I just burst into tears. <laughs> oh, wow. It was horrifying. If I hadn't looked up in my rear view mirror, I would probably be dead <laughs> right now. Fuck. <laughs> or just not in a good God, way. Do you ever think about how many near misses we've all had of like uh, no. just easily? I, I do it Don't. all the time. <laughs> uh, you can only do that for if my you own do. sanity. But <laughs> no, uh, I'm invincible. <laughs> I. I've never fainted afterwards, no. which is what poor Trisha does. That sucks so bad. Yeah. Too. I fainted once because I have a heart thing that's not life threatening. But the feeling of going down and not being able to fight it is really upsetting. It makes you mad because you're like, oh, come on. <laughs> like you have all these conscious thoughts. And you're like, but I don't want this. Like, no, thank you. <laughs> that doesn't matter. It's happening. I've only fainted once in my life and I don't remember that feel. I remember like looking at a school bus and then looking at the sky. <laughs> I, I, th- I There was nothing in between. It was so disorienting. I've blacked out. Is that similar? Yeah. Oh, okay. But that's, I mean, but that is what's <laughs> scary is the loss of time. Yeah. That she, she's been able to have some frame of reference, mm-hmm. but the, the first time you lose time, you never get it back. That, you know? That's true. Especially like, not having yeah. a watch. Yeah. Like yeah. she had, some idea of how long she's been in the woods. If you lose any time, that's out the window. Mm-hmm. You uh, you could have been out there for an hour, or you could have been passed out for who knows how long. Right. Mm-hmm. So she wakes up because uh, that storm finally rolled in. <sighs> we just you knew as soon as King said it might rain, it was yeah. for sure gonna rain. <laughs> And she wakes up to rain dripping on her face and a lightning a lightning strike exploding a tree at the bottom of that canyon, which Sounds that would have that would have made me stay right there. <laughs> to watch. Well, just to think like if some disaster is happening, help that's I don't need to start a signal flare. That's a pretty good one. So if you're lost in the woods, you should not set the woods on fire to be found. <laughs> no, because that's where you are. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> She throws on her poncho that she thankfully has, but 
the bugs, man. Let's talk about the bugs. Thank you. Because from here yeah, on, yes. it's <sighs> oppressive. There are like there are mosquitoes, and I forget what the name like it reminds me of gnats. I don't mm. know if it's a, a different word yeah, for gnats. Them or, noceums. Yeah, yeah, that are relentless, will not leave her alone. And I think when she faints, don't the mosquitoes land on her eyelids? Yeah. So she, when she comes to and it's raining on her, her eyes are swollen and she has bites all over her body. And when she puts her poncho hood over her head, the sound of the buzzing inse- insects is magnified. And she's always like, okay, don't slap at them. Be like a horse. You got to just mm-hmm. wave your hands at them, wave them away. And she starts slapping at her head she's like i gotta stop or i'm just gonna be smacking myself crazy it's so it's like this this like it's this injustice to her that never lets up that's always there and throughout the rest of these chapters you are reminded of it just i felt like as soon as you forgot that other just horrible inconvenience Mm -hmm. (laughs) this is why we should never go to the woods. <laughs> Just in general. Why are you going there? There are bugs. It's, I, I you can't nature. podcast from there. <laughs> hey, what, we've podcasted from a cornfield. We have. That is true. <laughs> the other horrible revelation she has here is that she is hungry. That would be my problem. <laughs> Food and water. And a, a warm bed. Okay, I'd have all the problems. <laughs> and, but that it's Not only is this a horrible revelation, but this also makes her realize there are probably other revelations I have not considered. Mm -hmm. The worst part of this is that when she pulls out the food that she has and eats and she, she has the thought like, I can't eat all of this because I might be out here a while. Mm. She is eating and she's, she's being considerate of this, but she is not worried. Or mm-hmm. no, she's worried, but she's not she still like thinks rescue. Like by the exactly. end of the night, yeah. she'll be home. And we see how much food she has, and we know that's not going to last very long. She has a hard boiled egg, a tuna salad sandwich, a bag of chips, like I assume a small snack yep. bag of chips, and a some bottle of surge, some Twinkies, and a bottle of water. And that's it, that's right? That's it. And like us as the readers are like, there's how much more of this book to go? <laughs> We're on chapter two. Like a uh, couple we, more innings, full game. Yeah, we we <laughs> know that it's not gonna. It's yeah. not enough. <sighs> it's the, like that survival stuff where uh, from that point on, when she took inventory, I was waiting for how King would like s- she drop her backpack off a cliff or something. Like there'd be like some way to lose the supplies that she had when she thought she could. Yeah. (laughs) So when that next part did happen, I was like, that's how we did it. All right. And then just the, I don't know if it would have meant anything, but that King steps out of his way to say she didn't litter the eggshell pieces. Yes. And that would have at least given a sign she was there if somebody had found it. I think it would have, because I don't think this is a point where she is out of the, range of where the all the experts are certain she is yeah so i think yeah it would have been a trail to her and it's when she's packing away all this that she realizes that she brought her walkman so at least there's something uh instead of listening to tub thumper by chambawamba <laughs> which uh, i mean it's, she's gonna get knocked down it's a classic she, oh she's gonna God, get up geez. again yeah Ooh. okay <laughs> but the question is are they ever gonna keep her down We'll have to finish the book. I I didn't expect you to do that, and I'm ashamed of myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you known. only have you to blame for I that. I know, you're right. So she flips it over to the radio function, and she hears her first time call, 309. So now she has something. And at 3.30, the news comes on, and there is no missing girl in the report. So she turns her Walkman off to save batteries because she doesn't know how long she might need it. And at least she knows that the Red Sox are playing at seven, so she can turn back that back on and listen to it if she wants to. I, okay, her next plan, while bad, at first I was like, oh, all right, I get it. It's from something she learned reading Little House in the Prairie books, was she hears a stream and she thinks, well, if I follow the stream, streams lead to bigger streams, leading to bigger streams, leading to the ocean. And if you hit the ocean before you find people, then that's not gonna work never mind the hundreds of miles of right. dangerous terrain if you right. follow it the wrong way or it doesn't go you know yeah also lakes exist <laughs> streams stop places <laughs> i just <laughs> yeah. you're so like indignant streams just, stop places <laughs> it's, it's just that 
on the surface, that idea does it just it makes has sense a to a nine year old it for a kid. Yeah, yeah. yeah. the it only makes sense. comfort it brings me is that she'll have access to fresh water if she would just stop at that stream and wait for rescue. Mm-hmm. I don't know the rules for drinking stream water. I know you're not supposed to. You're supposed to boil it because it can have yeah, stuff yeah. in it. That would make you sick. Yeah. yeah. And like the river. Don't drink the Mississippi River. Oh, oh God, no. Down. If it's but, brown, slow it down. Um, <laughs> That's what they say about drinking Mississippi. <laughs> this is such a Midwest episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're really letting our Midwest flag <laughs> yeah. fly. So she follows uh, this trail, like this route basically that she has now. And she does everything she can to make sure she keeps the stream in sight because that's now her only marker and what's funny is she's going along that bluff still but Mm -hmm. she has not had the guts to look over the edge yet and so this time it's coming towards like an end she's like all right i'm gonna do it and she gets down on her stomach and like army crawls (laughs) and it's like 20 feet it's so (laughs) much less and she's like yeah i could survive that can can she can she survive that she almost doesn't (laughs) i the the way this part was written I have never, even watching people fall down things like this, like in movies, like stunts, Mm -hmm. I've never really understood the mechanics of how, like when her, so she starts to slide, because it's, is this where it's slippery? Yeah, she's trying, she decides to climb down the embankment, because it's not Mm -hmm. a straight drop, and there are some rocks here and there, and some Mm -hmm. little branches sticking out, so she thinks she can maneuver safely. But it's all loose, Mm -hmm. and she doesn't know where it's loose, so she does lose her footing and goes down really hard on her side, and then she starts to slide uncontrollably down. And it's it's the it was the point when I think it was her foot like just hit a very lodged firmly rock, and that just sent her body flying Catapulting. through the air, somersaulting. And I was like, oh god, like that. I know this sounds this sounds so stupid, but it's like that's how it happens. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Well, in movies, it's always like somebody rolling down just on their side, rolling or like the way yeah. you would roll down a hill if you were voluntarily rolling down a yeah. hill. But it's so much more violent, a, a tumble yeah. down just a to hill. Yeah, hit something that's not moving and yeah. you just go. It's once so you, like, once scary. the momentum starts, mm-hmm. you just you go with it. And it gets worse. Somehow. <laughs> yeah, she crashes into a tree and not just a tree, but just so happens to crash into the wasp's nest that's in the tree. So it is it is almost too much. Yeah. Right. It is, it's it so is, seriously written, though. Other, It, it sounds mm-hmm. cartoonish the way we're laying it out. It, it's just the, the whole book up to this point. It is so many over the top disasters that happen back to back over and over again. It is just like it can't can it be enough that she's scared in the woods. She has to fall down a hill into a wasp's nest that's it's too much uh but it, it works it's effective yeah. but man, like she gets stung in in the the back she gets stung mm. stung in the eye well by her or eye not by in, her, the yeah, eye. Not in <laughs> her eyeball she gets stung by her eye and like i sometimes i keep forgetting that it's gonna be sw- like it's swelling shut yeah it's almost completely swollen shut uh but and she <laughs> has the moment where she's like well I know I'm not allergic now because I would be very dead. <laughs> Luckily, though, she runs kind of mindlessly, but she runs to the stream. And so they stop following her. Yeah. This was that moment I was talking about that. How do we damage or get rid of a surplus of supplies? Mm-hmm. Because she realizes now she has time. She can check. And I was expecting bottle of water burst all the way mm-hmm. open. It's actually not that bad. The Everything's just mush. Yeah, everything is like... A, <laughs> crushed and yeah. she has she's gonna have to deal with that but her uh beverages are still intact her game boy's crushed her game yeah. boy is crushed rip she thinks that since her game boy is crushed her walkman probably will be too and she says a prayer like oh god please don't let it be broken i only mentioned that because that comes up again yeah. later. and somehow it is not okay this is the first time i <laughs> I was thinking way too hard about this, like being maybe a Jacob's Ladder situation. Mm. I wondered if it was really crushed and everything we get, like she has a head injury and everything we get with the (laughs) Walkman after this is her just hallucinating the game and the voices and that they're searching for. That's so dark. It's not that. Oh my God. (laughs) Have you finished the book? Do you know for sure? No. See? Mm. (laughs) (laughs) 
She, when she does take the Walkman out, though, it does work. It's somehow not destroyed. It's a little banged up. But when she turns it on, that's when she hears uh, she just so happens to hit the news report that was reporting her missing. They're searching for her. So she continues to run away from them as fast as she Mm -hmm. can. (laughs) It's the I I kind of get the the fact that. She's tr- she Darkness thinks she's is, rushing well, to meet them. Yeah. And, and it's getting dark. Yeah, she, and, she's bound and de- determined yeah. not to be here at night. And it's like, oh, girl. <laughs> it is very clear. The moment she's like, I cannot sleep here at night is also the same moment you feel like she knows she's sleeping out here tonight. Mm. So she, and <laughs> it's just a nice touch that she's not only scared of the dark, but she is still scared of the dark in her room where there's a street light outside. <laughs> so you just know that wilderness darkness is not going Mm. to be kind Mm -hmm. to Trisha. So she finds this crescent-shaped clearing that she can hold up in for the night, and she sits down on a tree, and CM, since you talked about it a little bit earlier, the praying about her Walkman, she tries to pray now, Mm -hmm. and and it feels forced. Yeah, and we get some... We get a little thing with her and her dad where she had asked him... This is the first time we actually get descriptions of her dad yeah yeah because it's been he's been built up to be like it's very obvious how important her dad is mm-hmm. but this is the first time we actually see her interacting mm-hmm. with him it made me kind of sad though because i feel like i could tell he was drunk in this conversation yeah. they're eating ice cream and she's asking do you believe in god and the way she describes him just like drunkenly slowly answering her she describes it as this moment of she felt special because he was taking the time to really think about answering her. It was like, this is where I cried the first time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, like I, the idea of having this conversation with my child broke my heart. <laughs> I do have to say that for the most part, even the childlike kingisms that Trisha mm-hmm. has usually put into the mouth of Pepsi. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I love Pepsi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even those are not so offensive that I, like, remembered any of them. I was just like, (laughs) okay, she's nine, it's fine. She has catchphrases. Yeah, it's whatever. It doesn't bother me uh, in this case. But this scene does have one of the worst bits of writing that I've ever read. Just, it's a single line, and it made me go back because I was like, the fuck does that mean? It is, she she is flashing back to just a few weeks ago when she was eating ice cream with her dad and asked him, do you believe in God? And there's this bit where she says, he said, God, like it was some new ice cream <laughs> flavor. Yeah. God, vanilla with God instead of vanilla with Jimmy's. And I'm like... That means nothing. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> what are jimmies? Sprinkles? Sprinkles. I didn't know that. You did, yeah, the sprinkles. They're called you, jimmies. That's so cute. Yeah. <laughs> Who calls them that? Like 80-year-old men? Me? <laughs> <laughs> I stand by it. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just that it, it, most of the book is pretty, pretty yeah. good. But that one line, I was like, that what? <laughs> Terrible. What did you guys think of his his answer? What he believes in the sub audible. I actually love this. Yeah, uh, that th- pretty close to my own mm-hmm. beliefs uh, on the matter. That yeah. like energy. God yeah. is the, the the stuff that makes the stuff happen. Like, don't yeah. think about it too much. It's beyond our understanding. There is or isn't. I don't know. It's this moment's so cool though because it sets up something that happens later when things are really bad and she's like lamenting essentially that God is just this kind of like ignorant energy. Yeah. It's not looking out for people. Mm -hmm. It's not making decisions. It's just something that exists and cannot dictate what happens to her. She has no control over that. And I really loved that moment too. It was cool. This is the, the part that messed me up was that it breaks my heart that while he's giving this answer, it's interesting because she is listening to him with all of her attention because mm-hmm. it's her dad and she cares about what he has to say. But it's also while he's answering that she's thinking about how far he's fallen, about the the lawn isn't cut mm-hmm. and he, she smells the beer on his breath. The swing mm-hmm. set. The she swing still set swings is, on just to make him happy. Even yeah. She's too big. <laughs> uh, that you can you can tell that he is he's given up. 
Mm-hmm. Like she can see that her dad has just stopped trying. And that answer didn't satisfy her. It wasn't what she was hoping for. So he's on his way back in to grab another beer. And she calls out like she describes it as it's almost like looking back on it now something made her ask again which i thought was neat Mm -hmm. and he she says but do you believe in anything else and he's like that tom gordon can get 40 saves this year (laughs) like (laughs) like, oh your heartthrob tom gordon will get 40 (laughs) saves this year and the fact that it was so not the answer she was expecting surprises laughter out of her and then she also just feels love for her mm-hmm. dad because she because he recognized Tom Gordon as her heartthrob, yeah. which he is. And he's being nice about it and not teasing her. And it just <laughs> and a, re- a real nice, wholesome father daughter <laughs> moment that is. also makes you realize that how far he's probably fallen. He's not far off on the game, though, because he's it's 44 in real life. Oh, really? Ta- Was yeah. it 44 that year? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. God, they play so many goddamn games in baseball. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> so many. So this doesn't really help her right now. She can't pray to the subaudible and she can't do anything else. So she decides to listen to the game. Do you guys want to talk about the the game she listens to? CM, do you have no. any baseball facts for us? <laughs> I <will. laughs> CM, please make this interesting. Because <laughs> otherwise, this was a huge waste of my time. You didn't tell me I had to make it interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to do my best. Forgive me if I fuck it up horribly. <laughs> I want to spend a few minutes talking about the games because I do think they're applicable to what's going on with her situation. We have the first game, which we we're getting now and we'll get the other one a little bit later. In this first one, this is a very exciting game. It's a nail biter. There's hope in this game, kind of like there is for her still at this point. Like she she knows, but it's not fully sinking in. She mm-hmm. still kind of has like those childish ideas of, oh, I'm not going to have to stay the night in the woods, am I? And even though several things happened in this game, as she's listening, that could have meant a loss, the things kept getting stacked against the Red Sox, like the single that Williams did. <laughs> they sure. hit, I'm doing my hit. best. Hit. <laughs> and they were down by enough that statistically they could have very easily lost the game. Mm. And that's why when she starts listening to this, she's disappointed because she's like, oh, I'm not even going to hear Tom Gordon. Like, he's not going to come in. And he comes in and somehow he gets the save anyway. And so she's not so lost and hurt yet that the idea of rescue or winning for her is out of the realm of possibility, even though her situation doesn't look good, which kind of mimics what this first game is. Of course, by the time the second game comes around, which we'll talk more about, obviously, it's filled with a lot of bad moments for the Red Sox. And she has experienced (laughs) several setbacks that make her feel helpless. Like this game is hopeless and she's hopeless. And is this is where she's really starting to doubt her ability to survive. And so I was trying to draw parallels. Maybe I'm stretching too hard. But, you know, King focusing on apparently this is like one of the greatest rivalries in baseball history, the Yankees and Red Sox, which I just didn't know because I don't follow baseball. So it's, we have them and then we have Trish versus the outdoors is how I was trying (laughs) to look at this moving forward. So, but there are parallels of resiliency and focus. Like when she decides to follow the stream, no matter, literally no matter what happens to her, it's sort of like that she's kind of like this strong baseball player in a way and her liking Tom Gordon because of his stillness. So I had to ask about that because it's like, is that like that sticks out to me, but is that significant or does it stick out to me? Cause I don't know anything. Mm-hmm. So I learned <laughs> that closing pitchers are specialists. Oh yeah. I didn't know that. Okay. Dude, being a closer is sick. Yeah. They only come out if it's a save situation. So if they had been losing the game, Tom Gordon wouldn't have come in because there would have been no point to because there's nothing he could have done that would have won the game, that would have saved it. Okay. So when they went up by a run, that made it a save situation, which is why they could call him out. Um, the closers tend to be very focused and chill and still because they have to be, but they all usually have these little rituals they do, like like superstitions, things to get them in the moment and focused. They might do things on the mound or like mm. walk around the mound or touch their hat a specific number of times and probably other things, which I didn't realize baseball was so superstitious. It's like well, probably the sports most in general. But yeah. That's one of the few things I, think I it's do know cool. about baseball. Yeah. Um, so Tom Gordon is different, though, because he doesn't do any of that. And when I understood that i wondered 
again, maybe I'm really stretching, but is that uncharacteristic stillness, which I'm now reading as stability because that's the opposite of her home life. Is that why she's drawn to him? Because she, I think she has a lot more problems than we see. Things Mm. common to a divorce, but I think she's just the sadder kid than than what we're seeing in her head, what's been made obvious to us so far. When things are starting to go bad, I think we I mentioned this a minute ago, she doesn't think of her mom or dad or brother for comfort. She doesn't wish that she could talk to them. She doesn't even really miss them yet. It's more like that sassy, like, oh man, what are they going to do? Mm. She thinks of Mona, her doll. Like she thinks of a doll for comfort before her family. And she has nightmares later about her dad being mean to her while drunk. That's and, definitely, oh God. there's something there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe it's the fact that a scene with a drunk dad and a wasp's nest <laughs> is bordering uh-huh. on yeah. self-plagiarism, uh, <laughs> but... It's, oh, well, later too, she doesn't, she's not missing her parents so much like she starts to think about him and kind of miss him but who does she focus on like who does she envision in her head and who is she having these imaginary conversations with it's tom gordon which goes to something you mentioned earlier i think it was ben Mm -hmm. about her ability to really visualize Mm -hmm. as i've been told that base a lot of baseball fans like listening to games better than watching them on tv because they're not so fun to watch on tv they're really interesting to listen to especially like the the announcers back in the day don't just narrate what's happening, but they make it like this really intriguing, interesting, fun thing to listen to. Yeah, like Brockmire. Everybody Trisha, should watch Brockmire. It's a good show. <laughs> Trisha knows the players so well that she is, while the announcer is talking, she is picturing all the little moves that they all do, which I don't know if that will come into play more later, but it's just really neat that she could do that. And then I'm not going to go into it, but I have baseball facts about what actually happened in the game this is based off of. I'm not even going to try, though. <laughs> <laughs> Save it for the outro. But yeah, what? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Here's your baseball. <laughs> I don't know. What do you guys think of, of any of that? That was a lot. Sorry. Um, <laughs> no, it's good. Yeah. Uh, uh, first thing, I love the idea of her. So I, I'd been thinking about her love of Tom Gordon. Mm-hmm. And obviously it's from her dad because her it's clear mm-hmm. her dad is a big Sox fan mm-hmm. and closers are very, very important in baseball. So she he already had a status because her dad, dad liked, liked him. him. Yeah. But then now that you say that thing about stability, I bet like that's on a level she doesn't realize she connects to it. I bet that that really resonates. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I do. I hope that we get more. Uh, this is weird for me uh, to say, but I do hope that if we do get more baseball, that it is a parallel. Mm-hmm. I, because I, I th- honestly zoned out because I did. I care too. so little about. That's this. why I. That's sure. why I talked to someone about it because I'm like I. I listened to it and I'm like crap. I got to rewind because nope. And then yeah, I read it and I was like, to me. I was thinking about something else while I was reading this. Yeah, it's you, so much more interesting to think that this is that, that this serves a narrative purpose. Yeah, well, and it, has it does too, too, because of the the chapter titles mm-hmm. and like everything like it. There has to be more to it. I Josh. love it because you <laughs> thought way too much about oh, it no. and Ben zoned out for the baseball. I can tell you yeah. exactly why this is so important, this this first game. Tom Gordon is a stand-in for her dad because her dad can't be that dad he was before. Mm. Because it is she first of all, she puts so much importance on Tom Gordon. But when he does come out, it, she even does the thing that um in the the last at bat uh, is Daryl Strawberry, uh, who is oh, from beast, the Simpsons, from, from the Simpsons, <laughs> known known Simpsons <laughs> cameo actor, and he gets a full count, which is two ball, uh, three balls, two strikes, and she absentmindedly knocks on the tree while she's listening, and it's earlier mentioned that every time there's a full count, her dad knocks on something wood. So those things, like she is connecting to Tom Gordon, but she is also absentmindedly echoing her father and those like things that she's learned from him. So that's where like I think that route is going. And it's also she puts astronomical importance on this game mm-hmm. because when he comes out, she says, if he, if Tom Gordon can get the save, I will get the save. Mm-hmm. So if he gets the save here, I will be saved. Mm-hmm. And again, I think that's 
a, a standard like you're you're a lost kid you you like you want your mom yeah. or your dad and if her dad is that person who's important to her she wants that's who she wants to feel safe by and uh is this the point where she has the thought maybe all the bad stuff is done yeah do you, do you remember that cuz that line um killed me mm-hmm. yeah because she has this thought of like uh all this bad stuff but maybe the the worst stuff is behind her That's- and the <laughs> the second she says that you're like oh no no it's well, not well it's funny she says that cuz she gets mad at the announcer who says something about the the guy coming yeah, that up he's to dangerous. that yeah she's like oh uh, why would you say that now he's going to be dangerous <laughs> also yeah i forgot another major point that when she's listening to this game before the socks come back and it's clear that Tom Gordon is going to come out, she still cannot turn it off because she takes comfort in the sub audible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She's listening. She is dialed in on all of the crowd noise that if she were normally listening would be the sub audible. Mm-hmm. So she's also, Oh, that's cool. Following her dad's <laughs> like, I'm telling you, it's her dad. We never explained what the sub audible oh, is. Yeah. It's just the, he, he, her dad talks about when you're, you're in an old house, you're in the house. Do you hear the, the, the fridge, the fridge running, kick on the uh, yeah, creaks and just the noise of the world kind of. Yeah. The, everything that is always there but that you get so used to Mm -hmm. that it fades into the background. Mm -hmm. I think it's just a really cool way of like, we're constantly surrounded by the, the world is full of beauty and terrors Mm -hmm. and all of these enormous emotions uh, and things in the world that we just in the course of day to day life are like, that's too much to think about. <laughs> uh, and it kind of fades into the background once she gets put into this position where all of the, the she has to dial in to the sub audible because mm-hmm. it's all there is, all is out here. I don't know. It's a cool idea. I like it. So before she goes to sleep, she gives one single point to the sky, which is what Tom Gordon does when he gets the save. Just a simple gesture. Nothing fancy. It should be a moment of like triumph because it's this triumphant gesture. And she just mentions how much more alone it makes her feel. Yeah. Bummer. So bad. Luckily, she'll be safe. Oh, wait, there's something large breaking branches that can be heard in the distance. Mm -hmm. And that's all we're going to get from that for right now. (laughs) Next, we got a, a King Dream sequence. We touched on it a little bit, but any any additional thoughts on the King Dream sequence? Well, now that Ben has put Jack Torrance in my head with the wasps, <laughs> yep. I'm I'm thinking of that kind of per- unique parental cruelty. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of one of those dreams, and I couldn't tell at first. I was like, is she dreaming about something that had happened, or is this just a nightmare? It could very well be something it's, that happened. It doesn't could be really, either way. Because yeah. she she thinks that like normally dad isn't mean, but right now he's being mean to me. Mm-hmm. And he's just kind of berating her for not wanting to go into the cellar to get him a cold beer. Mm-hmm. Which is absolutely something I can imagine he has done. And right. she just is so adoring that. She doesn't think about it. Mm -hmm. I just realized that earlier we talked about uh, that she's so happy that she he thinks she's like he knows he's my heartthrob and he's not being mean about it. Does that Mm -hmm. mean he's been mean about it before? Maybe that's I don't like that. Like I said, I think that's why her family are the last people she thinks about Mm -hmm. for comfort. So she wakes up in the night disoriented and crawling out. She sees how messed up she is in the reflection of the water. One of her eyes is pretty much swollen shut. The, everything hurts when she moves. There's the that voice, that cold traitor voice in the night here, too, that also tells her that there is something out there that is waits for the lost ones. And it's just waiting for her to get more afraid before mm-hmm. it comes Slender out. Slenderman. I love <laughs> she. She describes this voice as gleeful on top and cold on the bottom. Mm-hmm. And the the voice acting of this voice. Extremely good. And has she nails yes, the, the she, book. I can, it's outstanding. I had to rewind and listen to it again. It's like, oh my God, she just, that's the best bit of voice acting I've ever heard. Wow. Yeah, she's, it's, it's amazing. very, very good. No, this part scared the shit out of me. Mm-hmm. I, I hate yeah. this. I don't like the woods. 
I don't, I don't like monsters. No, I like monsters. Monsters are pretty cool. <laughs> but no, it's this, this, she had uh, this cold voice that is mocking her in her head. It says, you know, just keep looking. Any second now, you'll see its face. Mm -hmm. And just imagining being in the middle of the woods in the pitch black of the night. You don't recognize night, those alone, shapes and shadows. <laughs> and I can see it so clearly mm -hmm. in my head, just a monstrous face suddenly appearing. Nope, mm -hmm. nope, don't like it. it or gave a bear. Me it gave me real like uh, long boy energy uh, of the there's this thing in the woods and mm -hmm. she even it even says like y you will go insane the second you see it and you'll die laughing it's because that's what crazy people do it's so scary yeah mm -hmm. but it's human right we're gonna get I to it I, I think it's human what what do you think CM I don't know CM's finished the book she's trying to tell no that would be <laughs> as much trouble as she's had making her way through like. Too much it, effort. Be, That's not, too much effort to kidnap a kid. There are other available children around. That misdirect is so pointed. I also we will get there. Okay. <laughs> this episode is so okay, long. Let's move on. Oh my god, <laughs> we're not even close. So, um, I want to ask you guys. This is another point we get. Uh, we've had a few periodic check-ins with the outside world with what her family has been doing. Mm -hmm. It was really that that one at the top. And then it didn't happen for a long time. And I didn't even catch the one at the top, I think. Because when it happens here, it blew my mind. Yeah. I, w I was like, oh, fuck. I didn't realize we were going to change perspectives at all. Yeah. I wasn't expecting it. Well, how are you guys enjoying that? Is that enhancing things for you? Or do you wish it was not happening? Is this, you... Are they in the hotel room? Yeah. It doesn't bother me. It's just a such a brief moment. And it... Mm -hmm. Honestly, it doesn't it doesn't pull me out and it doesn't mm -hmm. take me away from what she's going through or ruin any like tension, I guess. I, I, I think it adds right. tension. I think it's incredibly effective because suddenly we get this chain shift of perspective and we find her parents, uh, her mom is in this hotel room being looked after by the police and her dad is flying in to, to uh, be with the family. And we find out that there have been Search parties, mm -hmm. trained woodsmen mm -hmm. in the woods with dogs all day, and they have not found her because she is nine miles away from their primary search area. It is it, it is so effective yeah. Yeah. at immediately making you feel hopeless. Because mm -hmm. you are suspecting that as she's making her way through the woods. But I think part of you is like, maybe she's yep. going parallel to something useful. No. No, having <laughs> the definitive, like, no, it, she's yeah. fucking lost. Mm -hmm. After we check in with the family here, we cut back to where Trisha is, and she is yelling and begging whatever this thing is to not get her. She's just a kid. Mm -hmm. And it listens. She hears the branches break moving further and further away, and she pretty much just counts her blessings, crawls back under that tree, and she imagines Tom Gordon watching over her. I just love that she asks Tom Gordon the secret to closing, <laughs> and she, uh, it, this is, again, her very active imagination. She imagines first that his answer will be like God or practice or something like that, but it's actually this very great detailed thing which i absolutely love and it's basically his his uh, secret to closing is you gotta let them know you're the guy yeah. they're not the guy like, <laughs> that fucking rules that made me excited for the second half of the book mm -hmm. like that has to be that has to come back in, yeah because first of all trisha if if this book ends with trisha fucking lost in the woods <laughs> I'm going to lose my entire goddamn oh, mind. Yeah. So this has to play into mm -hmm. like the finale. Mm -hmm. Her there there's gonna be a part where she stands up and shows someone that like she's the guy. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I fucking love that. I'm excited <laughs> for that. I do wanna this last check in with the family before the end of this chapter. We just get that the dad has shown up, mom and dad had sex. None of that matters. What really matters is her brother Pete, who's in the adjoining room and yeah. is having this the dream. And I'm sure this isn't a dream. Uh, he's thinking about fighting with his mom on the trail. And the only reason he turned back from his mother was so that she didn't see that she landed a blow that made him start crying. 
And through tears, he looks back and sees that she's gone. So that's like we get a hint that that's how they found out she was gone. And so gone that it's like he never had a sister at all. Yeah. Mercifully, she sleeps through the day, but when she wakes up, her body feels like shit, of course. And things go from bad to worse because the stream has turned into a bog with a bunch of dead trees. Clearly a fire tore through here. And this sucks. Yeah. It's that realizing she decides she either has to push on, but she can always turn back. And then <gasps> again, no. King with the <laughs> most people don't consider that when things get too far that they should turn back. They've gone too far to turn back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this, we don't have to go into the blow by blow because it's a lot of her slogging through this. It is just, if there is one thing, uh, another thing, <laughs> Ben Graham's survival <laughs> tips, don't fucking get your feet wet. Yeah. Uh, just, I mean, just being wet in general mm-hmm. is the worst. That's so, it's so demoralizing. Mm-hmm. It just feels, at least for me. Yeah, I no, it's awful hate it mm-hmm. and once she is getting into this bog land you're like mm-hmm. no she's gonna wade out into it not have any way to to not completely soak everything mm-hmm. it i this part's so frustrating for me because i just keep thinking once you have hit a place where no humans would reasonably travel like you are outside mm-hmm. of possibly being found I don't uh, pursue that. <laughs> also, uh, not that I'm a fucking trained woodsman, but up to this point, she's been leaving tracks. You can follow. Oh, fuck. You can follow mm-hmm. someone through the woods. Once you enter a bog, you're not leaving a trail. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially, and then once she she kind of like sits down on a log and like gathers her thoughts. And up to this point, she has been traveling in one direction because she has been following the stream. The stream doesn't exist anymore. And when she heads out, she just picks a direction because she thinks she sees a hill in the distance. Mm. She is now completely cut off her trail and is going in a random direction. And she doesn't see it's not a hill. And it's a, and what happens with the deer head, too, Ugh. this whole section it's like if if you were reading i know i mentioned this on the last book we covered but i don't know why it's in my head if you're reading pet cemetery where it's almost like that that fever dream where he's Mm. seeing crazy shit and he's walking through the woods it's it's like that except just all real like actual things yeah Yeah, the the brutality (laughs) of it is reminded me of that but not explain for everyone the deer yeah Yeah. okay fucked me up well, she's just making her way from like as solid footing as she can find and things to grab onto. And she sees this, like, what she call it? The island of whatever those berries are called. Yeah. Some, fiddle fern or fiddle figs. Yeah. Something edible figs. that her mom taught nibble her nubs. about that we will <laughs> <laughs> nibble nubs. The, the <laughs> island of nibble nubs. Yes. She is going to make her way towards that because she knows she can eat the fruit and the leaves and they're really tasty too. And she doesn't have any food and she had passed other bushes with berries that were edible, but at the time wasn't hungry. So didn't think Mm. about creating a supply. And she starts to get over there and it's, and again, like bugs have just been on her this whole time, but she sees just like this mass, this swarm of flies and other insects and blood all over this like little she describes as like this island of this edible yeah. nibble nubs. Nibble nubs, thank you. <laughs> yeah. And she sees a severed deer head. And describing the the neck wound of it, like the stub of the neck as having a buzzing black collar because of the flies and bugs that are on it, made me feel nauseous. <laughs> it was really awesome. <laughs> <laughs> And and so she's like, well, fuck that. I'm not getting those nibble nubs. So she finally like makes her way further on and then sees the rest of the carnage of this deer. And she's also been seeing, or maybe it's like right after this, where something has like slashed. That's why I wasn't sure it was a human. Yeah. Has slashed this tree. Like she describes it as it was in their way or its way and it just knocked it over. Yeah, and also the the body is in two halves. Yeah, why? The deer body's in two halves, yeah. and the head, and that is like, it's not a casual distance away. It, to her, it seemed like something did that 
to ruin her opportunity yes. to get that mm-hmm. food supply. I love it's, that. It's it is so spooky. Yeah. Intentional. And it is so, it's surreal. It's yeah. uh, great. I, when it's, it wasn't until she reaches the second island that is how far away? It's a significant. Mm-hmm. A significant distance away. She like finds an another yeah. area with these nibble nubs and she finds the body. Yeah. Like, also, wh- why? <laughs> if, if nothing else, any other type of predator other than bugs have come at this thing yet, how recently was it left there? Sure. Like, where's whatever did that? How far away Ugh. is it? Not far, it seems like, right. based on what happens at night. Her journey eventually does take her out of this bog over a hill and she sees a, a fresh stream and she runs down. She eagerly drinks out of it and it's the best tasting water she's ever had and figures this is the next option to make a camp. So she kind of builds herself a rudimentary setup with stuff that's around, uh, pulls out the Walkman and the signal's weaker. And I don't know why that made me as sad as it did. It's such a bad sign. <laughs> but it's, yeah, it's so bad. It's so stressful because I, I got the sense during the the first game that she is listening to, uh, she is talking about listening, you know, we talked about the sub-audible. She's listening to the crowd mm-hmm. of people, and she is thinking about how alone that is making her feel, and how she is so terrified to turn the radio off because once she does, she will be alone in the woods with nothing but woods noise. And having the radio starting to not work Mm -hmm. is such a huge, like the feeling of approaching the end. Like so much of this book is just slowly listening or slowly reading about a little girl dying in the woods. I was just thinking starting to feel that way. Yeah. And it's so hopeless and like just the the static on the radio is just a sign of it will be worse this whole this last chunk you it it does have that it can't get worse and then right here it proceeds to get back to back worse because uh she cannot stop vomiting and shitting Mm -hmm. and it just burns and it's terrible and she's already dehydrated she's already Mm -hmm. dehydrated um a call has come into the main police station about a uh, the caller saying that Trisha has been kidnapped by Francis Raymond Maserol, who will rape and kill her in a few days if they don't catch him. It gives him gives them the car and says they're probably in Connecticut by now. Quick question for you guys: yes. This is the other part that, and it, I think we realize this is not the case. Like right after this, but for a moment, I thought, oh, is she is she with this person? Did she actually get kidnapped? And she's being harmed and she's like this is the fever dream like there were two mm-hmm. things where i'm like she's not really lost in the woods this is something else happening to her just because of the kind of fantastic elements of what's happened not the case but also the person who called in i felt like is either maybe i watched too much true crime it like crazy weirdo or the person who's committing that crime like trying to interject themselves into the thing in the woods is the guy who made the call he is That's a what I was trained thinking. woodsman. Oh, uh, I don't like it. No, I want it to be had, a monster. It's have less found, scary. <laughs> has found her mm-hmm. and is tracking her. And he made that call specifically to get them looking elsewhere. Can't it just be a That bear? was my first thought too. And it's so it's fucking gotta be. scary. And that is <sighs> no. so much more fucking nihilistic. It, this book is bad enough when it is, like I said, a little girl dying in the woods. That sucks. But adding the, oh, it is not just, this is not a little girl versus nature. It is a little girl versus, oh, on top of it, humankind is evil Mm -hmm. and awful. It's a bit much. I'm going to stick with my supernatural bear theory. We'll find out who's. (laughs) Honestly, I would rather. I I know. I know. That's why I'm sticking with it. Josh, you look really sad. Well, uh, the third terrible thing that happens is the socks lose. Bummer. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> that would have gone better, but you really jumped on it. <laughs> <laughs> so back at camp, it's a lot more of just Trisha suffering. She thinks that she thinks like, I'm not, I definitely, the water made me sick. I can't drink it. And then she does again and it still thinks by the morning, she'll either be dead or so sick. She'll wish she was dead. Mm-hmm. And that 
is when we see Tom Gordon for the first time. I love fully this. imagined. Mm-hmm. It's so great because it's like it's this is the middle of the night again, right? Yeah. Because it is it is pitch black, and she's talked about how the moonlight, how bright the moonlight mm-hmm. is, that she's surprised how well she can see in the dark. But she sees Tom Gordon in his baseball uniform is so white it nearly glows in the moonlight. Mm-hmm. It is, it is like witnessing a guardian angel yes. come down. It's really cool. And she just admires his stillness, even though from her angle, he looks almost perfectly still. But she knows that behind his back, he's twirling the ball, finding the placement of his fingers on the stitches, waiting for the pitch to be called. And she decides she's going to emulate that stillness because she is having hot and cold flashes. Mm -hmm. So she's sweating, but she's also has her teeth chattering. She's all miserable and she focuses and she stabilizes herself and becomes a mirror of her idol and she she manages to get back to sleep and as she sleeps something came and watched her and it watched her the rest of the night and when it left it didn't go far the bear the bear did it (laughs) and that is it for this episode of dairy public radio as always thank you for listening join us next episode where we will be finishing the book For Joshua Kahn and Benjamin Graham, I'm Pepsi Alexander reminding you the world had teeth and it could bite you with them anytime it wanted. Hey everyone, CM Alexander here. Thank you for listening to The Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon Part 1. We hope you enjoyed it. Let us know your theory on what's chasing Trish through the woods on our Facebook or Instagram at Dairy Public Radio or Twitter at Dairy Public, and you can send us an email at dairypublicradio at gmail.com. Don't forget to check out our Patreon page for bonus episodes and early releases. Search Dairy Public Radio on patreon.com and our Etsy store for all kinds of awesome merchandise. That's all for now, listeners. Goodbye.